This is Dr. Netta Joya here at Integrative Vision in Shrewsbury, New Jersey. I decided to create a Zoom webinar discussing some of the issues that we're going to hit with the new school year, and that means more remote learning. So I know this is kind of like a difficult time for everyone because there's a lot of stressors in our lives, and really the goal is to give you some tips to perhaps reduce some of those stressors. So I'm a general optometrist with a, uh, with a background in ocular nutrition. So I really find value with creating preventative medicine protocols for my patients. And um, in the first part of this webinar, I'm gonna be talking more about the blue light exposure with digital exposures of this increased computer slash tablet use whatever your school district might be using, in addition to what your kids are doing um, on a normal leisure use. In uh, the second part, we'll be transitioning to Dr. Kirti Patel, who is the founder of Beyond 2020. She's a colleague who has a background in vision therapy and pediatrics, and she'll be discussing more of the binocularity issues that we find with kids who are um, really increasing that near work demand. Lastly, we'll be talking with Michelle. She is from LE Kids, who's a former teacher and she's a master's in nutrition. And she started a unique company to really help parents integrate nutrition into their kids' diets, but in a way that it's more of a learning experience um, versus just telling them what to eat. So I'm really excited because we get some real unique ideas here and I'm going to start with basically what's happening with blue light. So rewind, when I started practicing optometry, my conversations about computers were with my computer patients, my IT patients, and boy has that changed. Um, I think we can all agree that it's a part of everyone's lifestyle right now, including myself. And now, unfortunately, we're increasing that demand on our children for learning in addition to leisure. Um, so recent publications have really been consistent with showing that all kids, including preschool, uh, toddlers, they're all above and beyond the screen time limitations that were announced by the World Health Organization and et cetera. And even more recently, the American Academy of Pediatrics is actually they're altering their recommendations knowing that we are going into a unattainable time of these recommendations. I mean, it was almost only two hours for like six to 10 year olds per day. And that's, that's basically in, impossible at this point. So um, fast forward now, we're, in a point, we're at a part of our lives that we have to deal with it really. And um, it's pretty, pretty remarkable where some surveys show that over 50% of the population hasn't even heard of the word blue light. They don't even know what it is. And um, I'm here today to give a little bit of that highlight of what it is and how we can reduce its issues because it is fairly harmful. Um, so blue light comes from the sun and also digital devices from the LED background. And it's a part of the visible light spectrum, and it really is around 380 to about 500 nanometers. And the worst part of the blue light is on that shorter wavelength. And the reason why is that our eyes have the capability of reducing UV from certain structures of our eyes, like the cornea and lens. But that's not the same with blue light. Blue light is a high energy light that actually penetrates penetrates right past through those media. And it goes right through all the way into the back of the eye called the retina. And arguably it's actually worse in children and that's because they have nice clear eyes. They have healthy eyes that allow all the light in. Um, and, and typically their pupils tend to be slightly larger than adults as well. So knowing that this blue light gets into the eye so dramatically, is one in, in of itself a potential issue. And there's a lot of research being done on how that damage is occurring in the actual internal structures of the eyes. And there is a little bit of a debate there. But also 
how is this affecting our physiology or changes in melatonin production, which is actually a little bit more disturbing to me on the short term. And that's because there is a lot of research that already shows that. Um, the other part of blue light that we don't talk about is that there is foundational nutrition uh, phytochemicals that actually mitigate blue light issues. And in the back of the eye in our macula, we have mainly two big, big carotenoids, which are called uh, lutein and zeaxanthin, which a lot of parents don't even know what that is. And um, a subcategory of mesozeaxanthin, but really we want to focus on lutein and zeaxanthin that's densely accumulated in the central retina, which is called the macula. And they absorb a lot of that blue light and they attenuate a lot of the issues with blue light and they help with sharper um, sharper vision. So going back to the melatonin issues, um, we have other things that are connected to digital uh, overexposure. Obesity, sleep, as we said, social skills, uh, learning issues. Um, these are even outside of computer vision syndrome or digital eye strain, which can become headaches, eye pain, things like of that nature. But we, we have other issues that have been shown to be connected to um, this new digital world we live in. So going back to the sleep issue, uh, people don't realize that melatonin is actually an endogenous hormone. So we make it. Uh, we make it through the pineal gland and it's a conversion. So the serotonin is converted to the melatonin by the pineal gland when the trigger is no light, okay? In particular, no blue light. So that conversion happens with that trigger. The precursor to serotonin is actually dietary, which is called tryptophan, which is a type of amino acid protein that we actually have to ingest. Uh, it's essential for that foundational piece. So, I mean, there's so much that just in that conversion alone from the diet part to the blue light part. So it's, it's directly all connected. So we want to give this pineal gland the trigger of no light uh, about two hours before bedtime. And that's because we want the production of melatonin to peak while we're sleeping and really help with, with our sleep pattern and our circadian rhythm. The other part of melatonin people don't realize is that it does a dance with cortisol, which can be a 40 hour webinar in and of itself, and they have to be inversely um, connected. So when our cortisol is high, we want our melatonin very low. And when our cortisol is low, we want our melatonin high. So that's in the mornings. So with kids, what we really wanna uh, emphasize is that blue light reduction towards the evening time to help relax them and help with this melatonin production. The other part of melatonin that's actually very concerning is that we actually don't know much about this hormone, but as research grows, we're finding so much of these melatonin receptors throughout the whole body. So it's, it's actually a very powerful antioxidant. It's, it's connected with immunity. So it's not just a uh, sleep, you know, a lot of people just think of it as this supplement you buy at the pharmacy for just helping you sleep. But we haven't even tapped into the other positive parts of melatonin because the research is just not there, but it is growing pretty, pretty aggressively. So um, looking into the future, do we wanna help support our kids in having proper amounts of melatonin. And that's, I, I would say, a why not? Um, so we can't stop everything about digital exposure right now. I mean, I think that's asking for way too much. Um, it's pretty much an impossibility, but let's start doing some, some changes in our lifestyles to help our children uh, reduce that stressor. So um, I, I made up some quick fi uh, five tip list. And the first tip is, hands down, and this probably goes in with also with eating, it's to make a plan together. Um, I always think, and I, and I 
educate my patients and it's the same with your kids. If you tell them what to do, it's different than teaching them why. So why are we reducing our screen time? Or why are we doing these changes of how we're sitting or using our eyes or glasses, however we, we're implementing these tips, why are we doing it? And just giving them a few little pointers of, of how it stresses the eye and how it actually helps with their sleep to reduce um, eye, uh, eye stress with the digital exposure in the blue light can in and of itself be a reason why the child actually accepts it. So make a plan and do it with your kids. Number two, you wanna actually boost natural blue light in the daytime. So the sun is the biggest blue light emitter in our, on, on our earth. So we want to actually have that natural sun boost in the day so that we get our proper patterns towards the evening. Um, so we want that low melatonin in the daytime and we want that exceptional darkness at night. So being outside, and that goes also with Dr. Patel, which she probably has heard about um, myopia issues and how outside being outside helps with nearsightedness. So daytime, being outside in the sun, whatever amount of time you can do, it's fine. Again, we do what we can, we can't be perfect. Then you wanna actually really reduce your blue light exposure roughly around two hours before sleep. So you either don't use any digital device two hours before sleep, or you could actually invest in proper blue light reducing uh, glasses. Um, there's different brands out there and it's, it's definitely growing and you've probably seen a lot of commercials and things like that. And it, and it, and it works. Um, just make sure that it's, it's absorbing enough and, uh, really hitting that lower tier wavelength mark, which is around, uh, below 450 nanometers. Then we want, uh, tip four, where we want to, um, have our room lights on when we're using digital devices. And that's going back to the pupil size. We want to reduce our children's pupil sizes while they're using digital devices. And last but not least, which is probably, it should probably be number one, two, is looking at the diet. Um, Michelle's going to talk about this a little bit more, but we want to have proper intakes of carotenoids. Uh, which are basically these um, phytonutrients that we get from green leafy vegetables, primarily uh, the yolk of an egg as well. And the biggest bang for our buck is lutein and zeaxanthin. And again, that those two carotenoids are not spoken about. Mostly right now, everybody's talking about blue light glasses, which is which is fine. But we also have to talk about not the out to in, but the in to out, right? So we want to replenish the macular area and help fight off some of these damaging rays naturally. And that's by ingesting it in our diets. So include, uh, including green leafy vegetables, which as I said, Michelle might give us some more tips on, on a daily form is really important. And again, educating our children why we're doing it is probably the most important for compliance. And lastly, it's going back to the melatonin precursor, making sure that we're getting enough protein in our kids' diets too, which, uh, which today's highlight is tryptophan, um, which is found in a lot of poultry and even some seeds. So I think those are some of my tips. I'm gonna be writing it down and we'll have an attachment to the webinar, obviously, um, so that you can see it a little bit more uh, in, in plain sight, but, I hope that this gives us a little bit of a foundational piece to even open up the conversation about how digital devices are affecting our kids. So now I'm gonna actually introduce Dr. Patel from Beyond 2020, and uh, she's gonna talk about some binocularity issues. Thank you, Netta, for inviting me today uh, to join you and Michelle in this webinar. I'm honored and very excited to be here. I'm Dr. Kirthi Patel from Beyond 2020 Vision Training Center, and today I'd like to give you an understanding about vision, how it impacts learning, and leave you with some tips uh, for remote computer-based learning. When people think about vision, they often think about 2020. So what does that 2020 mean to you? Many people understand it as being perfect vision. 2020 is a measurement of how clearly you can see in the distance. 
uh, we've all seen an eye chart. That large E generally measures 2200 vision. So the smaller the letters we see from 20 feet away corresponds to our visual acuity. So if you have 2020 vision, uh, what it means is you can see clearly at 20 feet what we ideally or normally want you to see at 20 feet. If you have 20-40 minute vision, it means standing at 20 feet, you can see clearly what a person with 20-20 vision sees clearly at 40 feet away. The same goes for 2010 vision. And yes, people can have better than 2020 vision. It means standing at 20 feet, you can see things that people with 2020 vision can see clearly at 10 feet. So for children in the classroom, that 2020 measurement is important because it ensures that the child can see the board clearly. But what does it mean or how does it affect remote computer-based learning? So did you know that visual acuity can be tested at, at near point as well? So we have a visual acuity for reading and computer-based skills as well. Um, most myopic patients or nearsighted people seem to understand this. Uh, myopes generally need their glasses to see far, but most of them will take their glasses off to be able to use the computer or to read. The same goes for hyperopic or farsighted patients. Um, these people are often missed in our pediatric and school screenings because those tests generally will test their vision for distance. And most hyperopes will pass that distance vision screening, but they often have difficulty up close because they're not being evaluated up close to see how their vision or their acuity, um, what their acuity is up close. Did you know that there are 17 different visual skills you need in order to succeed in reading and learning. I'm not going to discuss all 17 skills, but let's talk about a few of the foundational visual skills we need to succeed, especially now that most of our children are going to remote computer-based learning. So I want you to join me in a demonstration. I'm going to have you put your index finger about an inch away from your nose. So while you're looking at me on the screen, um, you should feel your eyes are pointing straight and you should see my eyes are pointing straight. Now I'm going to have you look at the tip of your finger. When you look at the tip of the finger, what did you notice? What did your eyes do? They converged. We need that convergence when we're doing anything up close. So say we're looking in the distance, our eyes should be pointing straight ahead. But when we're reading or doing computer-based activities up close, our eyes need to team together. This is called eye teaming or binocular vision, and they need to converge and stay converged as we uh, track along or we do anything up close. So imagine you're in this converged state all day during your remote computer-based school day. You felt that tension when you looked at your index finger. Imagine that tension all day in a child. How well are they going to learn? Will they want to sit all day and pay attention to what the teacher um, is asking them to do at such a close distance? So let's talk about focusing or eye focusing, um, also called accommodation. Um, so we have a system in our eyes that has to relax to see in the distance and it constricts to see up close. So join me in this demonstration. Pretend your palms are, is that visual system that um, manages your focusing system. So when your palms are pointing straight ahead and relaxed, it means you're looking in the distance. Your palms are comfortable, correct? Now we're gonna read and make a fist. So while you're reading, um, your, your palms, your hands still feel comfortable. But going back and forth, imagine in a normal school day, looking at the board, mm -hmm. writing something down, looking back at the board, you're not constantly in either state. You're flexing that system. But now imagine that computer school, that remote computer-based school day. These kids are going to be stay locked in this accommodative state. So go ahead and make a fist and make a really, really tight fist. Imagine exerting all of that accommodative system that these children have to stay focused and paying attention in school. Mm -hmm. Relax your hands. How do your fingers feel now? A little bit more tense. So again, 
how well are they going to learn if they're in this constant tense state, either because that focusing system is working too hard or their convergence system uh, can't maintain their convergence? Are they going to want to pay attention? How well are they going to succeed in school? This lack of an inability to release that uh, focusing tension from up close, when you felt that you know, your fingers couldn't release again, that's where these new myopes or progressing myopia begins to occur, right? So they can't release and relax that focusing system. And so we as optometrists and eye doctors give glasses to kind of compensate for that lack of re release. So these are only two of the 17 uh, visual skills a child needs in order to succeed academically, especially in this remote computer-based learning school day. Um, other things may include eye tracking, visual processing, visual memory, uh, but those are things I'm not going to delve into today. So how do you know if your child's visual system can handle this remote computer-based learning? Uh, vision tests by your pediatrician and school screenings by the school nurse generally will test for that distance 2020 vision. Eye exams by the ophthalmologist are also going to test for that 2020 vision. They're also going to check for eye health. I recommend a comprehensive eye exam by an optometrist that tests for binocular vision. That optometrist is going to be able to check for that 2020 vision that eye health, but also how does that binocular system work? Often glasses for computer use are recommended with an anti-reflective coating or the blue light filters. Um, and these could be simple and effective solutions. Other times people need a more, um, a more regimented uh, treatment system to kind of get their visual system to be able to handle that remote learning. And that's where that opt optometric evaluation is going to come in because it's going to let you know, can your child handle that, their remote, remote computer-based learning school day? But what can your child do daily uh, while on remote computer-based, uh, on their remote computer-based school day? Number one, computer posture is very important. The computer screen should be about 20 to 28 inches away from the eyes. The center of the screen should actually be four to five inches below your eye level. And the reason for this is it naturally allows you to converge versus forced convergence looking straight ahead. So our eyes will always in the downward position tend to want to converge. Additionally, add a comfortable chair that conforms to the body, uh, but make sure that chair is adjustable because you want the child's feet to be able to sit flat on the ground. And if the child is uh, too small, you may want to put a board that their feet can lay flat on the ground or on that board. Additionally, you want your arms to be kind of in an L shape in a comfortable position, not tilted up because it'll cause more neck and uh, back strain. Number two, minimize your glare. So an easy way may be to just add on the anti-reflective um, screens for your di computer displays or your iPads. Um, if you've been prescribed computer glasses, make sure to add on that anti-reflective coating because it has been shown to reduce visual fatigue, redness, eye strain, things like that. Third, make sure to blink. People blink one third less than they normally do when uh, staring at a screen. So get creative with your kids. Uh, my kids have decided that they're going to make eyelashes to put on their computer screens as a, a reminder to make sure they blink. Number four, take frequent breaks. So you may have heard something called the 20-20-20 rule. So what that means is every 20 minutes, look 20 feet away for as, or as far as your space allows you for 20 seconds. So in my practice, we like to include activities that uh, really integrate left and right brain uh, learning. So what we recommend is placing an infinity sign, like a horizontal infinity sign um, in that space where your child can look away to. 
And they can do a couple of things. Number one, just simply look at it. And that will trigger that left brain integration. The other is add some eye movements to it. So follow that infinity sign with your eyes. If the child's too young, use their thumb and track with their thumb following that infinity sign. So it not just gives them that release, but it also includes some sort of eye exercise to break that convergence and accommodation lock that they may be developing. I'm going to add another 20 to that 20, 20, 20 rule. So for every two hours of sitting on the computer or working up close, have your child take a 20 minute break, plan something out, maybe get, up, get a drink of water, eat a healthy snack, Ride out, uh, ride on your bike, get some of that sunlight in. Um, if you have a swing set in the backyard, you know, go on the swings. Do something that doesn't include holding that convergence and accommodation up close. And that includes no TV. Lastly, I would say drink a lot of water. Um, have them keep a bottle right next to their workstation. What that's going to do, it's going to help with, their, with dry eyes that develop with overuse of computers. Um, it helps brain function, and it also forces them to take a break. Uh, maybe, you know, stand up and use the restroom as well. So as you can see, 2020 is only a measure of vision. So make sure your, eyes, uh, your child's eyes are ready for remote computer-based learning. Call today to make an appointment for a comprehensive optometric eye exam that includes a binocular vision evaluation. Thank you, Netta, and, uh, for, and thank you for inviting me to join you on this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Patel. That was very, very informative, and those tips are so amazing. We're definitely going to put them in a written form so that people can reference to it. Um, we're going to continue this really great webinar with uh, Michelle from LA Kids, and it's all you. Thanks, Netta. I am so excited to be here today to talk about something that I am so passionate about. So my name is Michelle Esten, and I'm the owner and co-founder of LA Kids. Today, I'm going to discuss with you how nutrition impacts children's overall health, everything from immune health to eye health and more. My goal by the end of the webinar is to give you the tools and the resources that you need to establish these lifelong healthy habits with your children. So it is very normal to feel overwhelmed during times of uncertainty. And I would definitely include a pandemic as a time of uncertainty. And research has found that we make over 35,000 conscious and subconscious decisions every single day. So that means if you have little ones at home, you are not only making the decisions for yourself, but you're making all the decisions for your little one as well. As parents, I know it's important to pick and choose your battles. I think it's safe to say that when it comes to deciding your child's meals, you might feel at capacity with decision making. Instead of fighting with them about what's on their plate, it's just easier to choose convenient foods, order takeout, Choose the food that you know that they're familiar with and they already like. But the benefits of eating healthy for children are truly endless. Adopting healthy eating habits can help children not only to maintain a healthy body weight, but stabilize their energy, sharpen their minds, boost their immune systems, and prevent chronic disease. Introducing wholesome, nutritious foods is not going to be easy. It's not going to be an overnight fix probably not going to even be a week fix. It might take a month or a few months, but it does play an important role in your child's development and growth. So let's take a second to compare healthy eating with brushing your teeth. Your children don't wake up every morning and want to brush their teeth. They don't want to brush their teeth before they go to bed, but they know that they have to do it. On occasion, they might fight you on it, but they always get the same response from mom or dad, which is they have to do it. If healthy eating was treated the same way in the home, children would know over time they have to do it. When habits are introduced and instilled at a young age, it's no longer viewed as a chore. They know that it's not optional and instead it's established as a habit. 
Again, habits take time, so it's something that you have to consistently work at. Children who build a foundation for healthy habits from a young age are more likely to develop a lifelong healthy relationship with food. And that's something we all want. So I know that it's something that we definitely want for our kids as well. Before Netta invited me to speak for this webinar, we discussed commonly asked questions that she received from both patients and friends. The first one being, how do I get my kids to eat healthy? And the second one, what vitamins should I have my kids take? So I'm gonna cover some vitamins that support immune and eye health. And then I'm also gonna provide you with three actionable takeaways that you can start your kids' exploration of healthy eating and begin implementing in your homes as early as today. So we're familiar with vitamin C, which has those immune boosting benefits. And we know vitamin A protects our eyes. Vitamin A also helps boost the immune system as well. And the next two nutrients, you already got a little teaser from Netta before, but these two nutrients never seem to get the spotlight. And the benefits of them are just as significant, if not more significant than vitamin C and vitamin A. And these two nutrients are lutein and zeaxanthin. Lutein and zeaxanthin play a crucial role in protecting your eyesight from future eye disease that can be caused from the overexposure of blue light. We heard all about what, how blue light can impact your children's eye health, how it can disrupt their sleep cycles. So it's definitely something we wanna try and get rid of and nix before our virtual school years start. Before the pandemic, screen time across the board had already been on a steady incline. And now with working from home and potentially going back to school virtually, looking at a computer screen is simply unavoidable, which means your eyes are gonna be exposed to more blue light. Studies have found that individuals consuming a diet with higher levels of lutein and zeaxanthin were low and lower result in lower incidence of eye disease. This is because both of these nutrients carry out antioxidant functions that protect the body from the onset of chronic diseases. So some of these foods rich in lutein and zeaxanthin have already been mentioned, but foods that are rich in these two important nutrients include those dark leafy greens like kale and spinach, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, green peas, and egg yolks. So if you are making eggs for your kids in the morning, make sure that you're including the whole egg because that egg yolk is really going to help with their eyesight and protecting their eyesight. In addition to the damaging effects blue light can cause to your eyes, it can also block the hormone melatonin, which regulates the sleep cycle. So again, we heard a little bit of this from Netta before, but consuming foods rich in tryptophan is known to increase levels of melatonin, which can limit or reverse the, the negative consequences blue light exposure has on your sleep cycle. And foods known to be high in tryptophan, we've probably heard turkey makes us sleepy after Thanksgiving, and it's because it's high in tryptophan. Again, getting the whole egg is important. It's high in tryptophan. In addition to oats, tofu, some seeds like flaxseed and sesame seeds, some nuts like cashews, and again, those super important dark leafy greens. So to make your lives easier, since I just threw a lot of information about nutrients and the foods that are rich in those nutrients out at you, I've put together a free ebook that contains recipes rich in these vitamins and nutrients that I discussed with you today. So that will be available to you as soon as this webinar is um, up and running. So as I close my segment of the webinar, I want to share with you three actionable takeaways that can, that can help bring families together in the kitchen to connect through the exploration of food. Like Netta had mentioned before, instead of telling somebody why they should do something, actually teaching them how to do it is going to make the patient or the child want to get more involved and to understand the importance of why they should be doing it. So my first tip for you today is to meal prep. By failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. I know some people, the words meal prep may cause some anxiety, but meal prep should actually reduce the stress of meal time. The benefits of meal prepping far outweigh the cost. 
If you choose one day a week to make a big mess and to meal prep in your kitchen, it not only saves money and time each week, but you're not going to regret it. Having those easy, grab-and-go, healthy options stocked in your fridge and pantry will definitely remove the stress of mealtime. Moving on to tip number two, after you have successfully completed meal prepping, be conscious about where you're storing those healthy foods. If every time your child goes into the fridge or the pantry, they're looking at the snack shelf that's full of unhealthy snack choices, it's going to be what they're constantly asking for. If that snack shelf is out of sight, out of mind, and healthy food options, foods that maybe you've prepped ahead of time, like fruits and vegetables, replace the location of unhealthy snacks, then your child's more likely to gravitate toward those healthy food choices. And again, over, they might not immediately start gravitating toward those healthy food choices. It might not be a day or a week. It's a habit which takes time. So if you consistently do that, over time your child will understand this is the way that it's gonna be in my home. And last but certainly not least, tip number three, get your kids involved. Get them involved in the meal prepping process, get them involved in the kitchen. This is gonna look different for every family. So if you can bring your child food shopping, you can do that. If you wanna have them help you wash the fruits and vegetables once you bring them home from the grocery store, you can even let them help you prepare the meal. If you feel comfortable with them chopping, if you wanna have them just mix your muffin mix and help you put it in the tin, anything to get them involved. Because when kids become more involved in the process, you begin to instill a passion and a curiosity within them. And this is just going to really build a foundation for healthy lifestyle habits. So at Elite Kids, the company that I created, we view wellness as an exploration and not a destination. As a former elementary school teacher myself, I really saw firsthand how poor nutrition could impact a child's behavior, their attention and focus, even their development. It made me realize I wanted to make a bigger impact to a greater audience and in a different setting. And I wanted to get out of the classroom and do more for children. So that's what led me to create Elite Kids where I get to share my knowledge and passion for health with families and with children to help them establish healthy lifestyle habits that they can carry with them for the rest of their life. So just scratch the surface with information that I shared with you today. So if you enjoyed today's webinar and are interested in learning more about the different programs that are offered, um, you can check out my website, which is going to be linked with this webinar. I also post a ton of free content on Instagram, like recipe ideas and my most updated schedule. So be sure to check out my social media pages. And I hope you took some value away from this webinar and all the information that I shared with you. So I look forward to connecting and thanks, Nada. I'm gonna send it back to you. Thank you, Michelle. You really just uh, completed this, this amazing webinar because as we said, there's so much research on the front side of medical um, interventions, but we really don't ever bring in the nutrition section. And that's, that should almost be the first piece of the, the uh, protocol. So going back to the, the why of this webinar, it's really to just give everyone some tips to um, reference to, to, to help out. And I think, um, we all have our good insight as to how to incorporate some minor changes, even if it's just a couple, where we can really mitigate this new um, school year for ourselves and our children. So as everyone said, uh, there's going to be attachments to this webinar, and you could find all of us on our websites. Is there any, if there's any questions, obviously reach out to us, and we may even do a um, secondary Q&A piece which I will send out to everyone uh, regarding dates. So um, I hope everyone found some education here and some tips. Enjoy your last few days of preschool. And uh, I hope this is gonna be a good year for all of us. All right, have a good one.